Good evening, and welcome to a review of Alfred Hitchcock's 50th movie, Torn Curtain, a film that certainly doesn't have the reputation of a rear window or a strangers on a train, but uh, still a vastly underrated entry in the director's filmography by my reckoning. And a film that feels very much the product of the success of the James Bond series in a roundabout way. Hitchcock was obviously no stranger to the spy genre, and you can see many espionage adventures dotted throughout his career, but by the time he got around to making Torn Curtain, it had been a good few years since his previous foray into the genre, having, prior to Torn Curtain, made the psychological thrillers Psycho, The Birds, and Marnie. Torn Curtain was a very clear attempt to cash in on the spy craze of the 60s, of which James Bond was obviously a massive part in creating, so we have the Bond films that were clearly influenced by the films of Alfred Hitchcock, and now Alfred Hitchcock is being influenced by the James Bond films. Where Hitchcock's spy films tend to deviate from the Bond series, the most usually is that they tend to feature everyday people caught up in extraordinary situations, usually non-spies becoming entangled in an adventure brimming with espionage. While I wouldn't go so far as to call Paul Newman and Julie Andrews playing top US physicists as everyday people, there's certainly an every man and every woman quality to their characters, and as is typical with Hitchcock's spy stories, the focus is much more on the human elements in play, the pair's relationship and such, uh, rather than the nitty-gritty details of the spy plot. This is obviously quite a contrast with Ian Fleming penned spy stories, where the villain's schemes are drawn out and detailed and we're supposed to relish in them. Here, it's much less important. All we need to know is rocket fuel, something something, Paul Newman needs to get the something something because it'll be good for the good guys. Just a heads up, I'm gonna go into some plot details and talk about a lot of different aspects of the narrative, so if you haven't seen the film but intend to, as usual I recommend pausing this video, viewing the film in full, and then returning to this review. The film is split into three very distinct acts, the first of which introduces us to both main characters, but plays out largely from the perspective of Julie Andrews' Sarah Sherman, assistant and fiancé, to Paul Newman's Michael Armstrong, the pair of brilliant US physicists en route to a conference in Copenhagen, but mysterious goings-on are occurring, and Sherman eventually discovers that her partner is planning to defect to the Soviets and reveal all his something rocket fuel something secrets. Like I say, this is almost exclusively told from Sherman's perspective, and it's really effective as such. Andrews makes for a great audience surrogate for the first chunk of the film, and we're obviously sharing a lot of her questions and worries too. Why would her fiancé be doing this? Why has he kept all of this from her? What is the something something? Yeah, actually, scratch that last question, who cares? Julie Andrews is obviously an iconic star from her roles as Mary Poppins and Maria Von Trapp, and this was clearly an attempt on her part to move away from being typecast as the cheery musical lead lady. She was very much forced on Hitchcock to co-star in this, though, and it's well publicised that Hitchcock was not best pleased with his two leads in this venture. In relation to Andrews, he seemed to blame her typecasting as an issue, saying that everyone expected her to sing, but I think it clearly goes deeper than that. For what it's worth, I think that Andrews is great here. I like her an awful lot, and in retrospective interviews, she's actually been really quite polite about Hitchcock and working on the film, so it doesn't seem like there's any regret or animosity on her part, just more of a shoulder shrug at what could have been. Uh, he had sort of forgotten about the importance of screenplay and things like that, which of course he was hugely lucky with in the early days, yes. but um, even so, he was very kind to me, loved ladies, obviously and it was very funny, very funny to work with. I tend to find that the performances and the characters don't detract from my enjoyment of this film at all, rather what is detracting from my enjoyment is some of the rather old-fashioned movie-making techniques that Hitchcock is utilising, particularly in this film's first act. And specifically I'm talking about the overabundance of obvious studio sets and rear projection methods used throughout this film. Now, I can be totally fine with these methods in certain contexts, but here when they're using such obvious back projection for a simple sat-down dialogue dialogue scene between two characters in a restaurant, I'm completely removed from the reality of the film very quickly. I've heard critics make excuses for these methods that Hitchcock is reminding the audience of the artificiality of the medium of film, or that it's deliberately expressionistic in some way, but nah, guy just didn't want to go out on location too much. Hitchcock famously didn't care for shooting out on location, and yeah, I'd be amazed if any of these principal actors left California during this shoot, but when you're trying to make some kind of jet-setting spy adventure, it can just break the world of the film, and I'm not saying that they needed to cart everyone off to East Berlin in the mid-60s, but was there literally no restaurant in LA that could have been utilised for this scene? There's even a shot in here of Andrews walking through a restaurant set. I mean, could they not have filmed the whole bloody scene on this? As I say, I accept these methods in most contexts, and they're commonplace. Obviously not every film is shot on location, but here it just feels so especially lazy, and distractingly so. 
In the film's second act, focus shifts to Newman's character and is largely centered around a major set piece in which he is stalked by security officer Gromek, played by Wolfgang Keeling, certainly one of the film's most memorable characters, and largely thanks down to the standout murder sequence, the sequence for which the film is most known, in which Armstrong and an unnamed farmer's wife have to kill the man before he can reveal that Armstrong is not genuinely defecting to the East, but he is in fact doing all of this as part of a ruse to gain access to some Soviet scientists so that he can extract information from them to bring back to the States. It's a nice reveal and very much teased out throughout this entire act as we come around to Newman's character and what he's actually up to. Much like Andrews, I think Newman actually does really fine work here despite his own differences with Hitchcock, which in this case were primarily centered around his method acting instincts. For better or for worse, Hitchcock would often use actors in quite a mechanical way, people like Janet Leigh of Psycho fame have corroborated this, not that he was rude or dismissive of the craft, but ultimately actors would find themselves tailoring their performances to match his specific ideas of where the camera should be placed and so on. Paul Newman was the kind of actor who would have a lot of ideas about what to do with the character and he'd bring a lot to the table. He'd want to talk about motivations. My character goes over to a window to look out of it. Why does he do that? Whereas Hitchcock's response to that kind of questioning would be, your character does that because if he doesn't, the camera won't see his face. Again, though Newman was quite polite when referring to his time with Hitchcock, going so far as to say that they'd probably have gotten along all right if the script weren't so problematic for all involved. And yeah, it sounds like rewriting was happening constantly on the set. And that's a shame because there's so much talent to here. It's a really big shame that they didn't collectively produce something together that was truly remarkable. Hitchcock being bored with certain actors isn't uncommon in his filmography, but in Torn Curtain there's clearly much more attention given some of the supporting characters. Gromek, for instance, is a real standout. The actor has some really nice moments and is played really sympathetically. It seems like a conscious decision that the people Newman is defecting to aren't totally unlikable. They're not stoic, humorless communists, but rather have little quirks and traits that give them an awful lot of character. Gromek in particular, I mean, there's just a really nice bit when he's introduced and he's trying to make small talk with Armstrong, who's just having none of it, and he can never seem to get his lighter to work, but once he's killed, Armstrong manages to get the flame on the first click of the thing, and obviously his death scene is the standout sequence of the film, and one that's incredibly well-crafted. Hitchcock, of course, dragging out the murder as long as possible without it becoming overdone or comedic. Obviously, there was a kerfuffle with the film's composers, and Hitchcock fell out with longtime collaborator Bernard Herrmann on this film and hired John Addison for a more poppy soundtrack to appease the Universal suits, and both composers provided music for the sequence, but in the end, it plays to no music at all, and I think I actually much more prefer it this way. There's more impact from sounds like the shovel hitting and Gromek's grunts in this way. The final act of the film has both Armstrong and Sherman on the same page and concerns their escape. I do love, though, just how much drama is inherent with this setup and how they play with it throughout the film. In the first act, we're totally sympathetic with Sarah and her baffled reaction to her fiancé doing something so inconceivable. And then when we shift to his perspective and see it's all a front, it becomes tense because he can't immediately tell her the truth, but then there's a concern that she might actually reveal some important secrets to the Soviets because she just wants to be with Armstrong, and even if that means living the rest of their lives behind the Iron Curtain. Anyway, finally, the third act is the pair escaping once Michael has extracted the necessary information. Another side character I just adore, Professor Lint, played by Ludwig Donath, and the scene in which Armstrong has to gently coax the details he needs out of the professor without giving too much away himself or giving the game away is just so well written and escalates so nicely. I have no idea what they're writing on this board or talking about. I have no idea if it's even remotely accurate, but that's fine. I'm so invested in the human drama and Hitchcock really could construct this kind of thing better than anyone. In lesser films, I may well end up hung up on the deliberately evasive plot details, but with Hitchcock, I'm always just good to go along for the ride and not worry about such things. The standout sequence of the third act is the heroes escaping on a fake bus with the help of members of some secret organization that Armstrong and Sherman have become embedded in. It's a bus full of character actors and a few of them get nice moments to shine, and even though the back projection can be quite distracting and robs the sequence of some tension, it's a great sequence nonetheless. The complications faced along the journey and such, it manages to gradually turn the screws and ratchet up the tension in such a seamless way that I can look past some of the dated presentation. And it's not just the back projection, but how the thing is lit too. It all just ends up looking so flat and dull, TV almost. 
this should probably have been the climax of the film, and I mean, like, I'm a fan of this thing, and even I think that it goes on for just a little bit too long, the pacing certainly hits a snag once the leads leave the bus. Only to become entangled in the kooky hijinks of Countess Kuczynska, played by Lila Kudrova. So, I'm really conflicted here, because I love this character and this performance, Hitchcock clearly loved her too, but this whole little episode is so unnecessary with this Countess, who's uninvolved with the whole spy plot. She just kind of slinks into the thing, and she begs the heroes to sponsor her on a trip to the United States in exchange for helping them out of this situation, which basically amounts to taking them to a post office. Uh, even the leads look kind of puzzled and zoned out when she's wittering away, like even they don't know what this has to do with anything. Newman's method principles must have been really pushed to the limits with this one. She provides an interesting insight into what it might be like for someone stuck in the East, who's actually really desperate to get out of it, and the performance is brilliant. It's heartfelt, it's sympathetic, while also just having the right level of uneasiness about it. Like, can we really trust this woman? I don't know, but I just wish that it worked better with the momentum that had been established. Things really do grind to a halt for this little character piece, and it's something that I love in isolation, and I think it is saying something, but it just does nothing for the overall finale. Armstrong and Sherman leave her, and then that's kind of it. She's just out of the film. Then we have a whole sequence at a ballet, which it feels really unnecessary, and there's this mean ballerina character who causes problems for the pair, but ultimately things just feel very drawn out from the moment the pair leave the bus. When I was getting into films and seeking out Hitchcock's work when I was a kid, Torn Curtain was one that I rated very highly for a number of years, and was often quick to defend it and challenge the notions of it being lesser Hitchcock. Heck, even in the Universal Studios Hitchcock box set, it's the only film where the corresponding making of feature on the, uh, on the special feature features, there are no interviews with the cast, crew, critics, and it's the only one in the set like that. So honestly, I've never really seen much in the way of discussion or defense of this film, and even on this latest rewatching, I think it deserves a much better reputation than what it has. Certainly deserves a lot better than precisely no one turning up to defend it in the making of. Though I must say, it didn't hold up as well for me as it did in the past. For the first 90 minutes or so, I think it's absolutely great, and there are some standout suspense set pieces, classic Hitchcock stuff. The final half hour or so flounders by a lack of coherent plot direction, and things do fizzle out in a relatively unsatisfying way, which is a shame, because I think if it had a much better ending, it could have been more fondly remembered. As it stands, I think it's a fun piece of spy entertainment, with solid performances across the board and some true standout supporting roles. There are a few good sequences where the Hitchcock touch is firing on all cylinders. Uh, Torn Curtain is a relatively easy film to access these days as it's bundled in with many great films in the Universal Hitchcock box set, and if this disc has been one that you've been reluctant to give a whirl, well, I honestly very much recommend it. Don't go in expecting Strangers on a Train or Psycho, but there's lots to enjoy in this one for sure. I feel like this review ended up being slightly more negative than I anticipated it would. Like I said, I am still a really big fan of this film, and if you've seen the film and have opinions and thoughts on it, please do let me know yours in the comments section below. I find it's not very often that I get an opportunity to talk about some of these more obscure Alfred Hitchcock films, so I really do thank all the people who support me on Patreon who voted in that particular month's non-Bond movie review poll and voted this and The 39 Steps as the Hitchcock films to review. I hope my positives still came through, nice and strong, and if you would like to have a say in deciding what non-Bond movie reviews I upload to this channel in the future, then please do head over to my Patreon page for more details. Also below, you can find links to my other social medias, so my Facebook page and my Twitter page, for instance. Um, please do check out those, and with all that being said, until next time, spy fans, so long for now.